welcome everyone. Um, we are going to sing two songs. Um, and the first one is called I Found You. And the second, Awaken You. And uh, both songs are, yeah, were given by Jesus. Yeah. So
And the next song is Awake in You. Thank you to the Final Vision. I like, always like the name of that group. That's, it's like we're getting washed with music from the Final Vision, from the vision of Christ. It's like beckoning us into the tractor beam and there's no way any of us can resist uh, with, that, with those harmonies and those lyrics pouring through. It's like uh, all you have to do is behold it. You don't, there's nothing to do except receive it and experience it. Isn't that great? There's nothing to do with being beamed up by God, to be lifted up. It's, it's involuntary, the miracle is involuntary. I know when I read the, uh, the 50 Principles of Miracles at the beginning of A Course in Miracles, that was, that was one of them that really jumped out at me. A, a number of them jumped out over the years, but the one that jumped out pretty early to me was 
Miracles are involuntary and they should not be under conscious control. And when we're talking about the doer, the doer wants everything to be under conscious control. The doer is so concerned about behaviors and being, doing the right thing and uh, being correct and not making mistakes. The focus is always on the form and not on the mind. And uh, as we had a beautiful witness from Eska there in Japan, she loves her job. She's teaching English from 9 in the morning till 9 at night and she's having a ball and she's extending all this love and it's her attitude that's doing the teaching. She's not really teaching English, she's teaching love. And that's what all of us are called to do. Away from concern about outcomes and productivity and what does it mean to the world, it's, it's the feeling of love in our hearts and the extension of that love that is what it's all about. Even Helen Shuckman, the scribe of the Course, you know, she hung in there for a lot of years. Uh, it took seven years to bring through the Course from 1965 to 1972, but then there came a time a little bit later in her life where she felt like, well, at least I did it. At least I completed the mission. And then Jesus basically told her, well, actually it wasn't about the Course. And she was like astonished, like, what? What do you mean? It's it wasn't about the Course. And Jesus said, I love you. It's all that, that was what it was all for. All that taking down those words, all those clarifying things and going back to sentences where there was resistance and getting it straight, you know, all that was just a backdrop for I love you. That's the only thing that is important. Not even the book itself was important to Jesus. It was the love, I love you. And that's what we're being asked to accept when we release the doer. So today I thought uh, in, a, in a practical way what we could talk about is, because um, most people have that question, always the question comes up, how? How do I undo the doer? Here I've got my pad and pencil ready. You just give me the formula and I will write it down and I will follow the steps like a good student and then at the end I'm undone. And you know, we know that, that the undoing involves forgiveness but the, that has to be under the Holy Spirit's guidance. You cannot take personal responsibility for the, the seeming journey. You cannot as a person direct the undoing because the person is the doer. <laughs> why, why would you put the doer in charge of the undoing? <laughs> that that's not, doesn't sound very good, you know. <laughs> oh, I don't like the warden in this prison, so I'm just going to put uh, all the prisoners in charge <laughs> of, the, of the prison. Okay, our first decision is let's unlock all the doors <laughs> and, and get out of here, <laughs> you know. You, you can't look to the doer to do the undoing. You have to look to the Holy Spirit. And yet, there is no formula. So it's not like you can be given a formula. You can be given the essence of, of the teachings, which is what the Course is, but then you have to apply it. it. The practical application is what is needed. And Jesus even says that. A theoretical uh, basis is helpful. The text gives a theoretical basis, but it's in actually doing the exercises and experiencing that peace and happiness, that's where the undoing of the doer occurs. So, I thought the most helpful thing I could do today is, we always give lots of examples and witnesses, but uh, Jeff was just mentioning um, the music that you've been hearing has come through Slava, and yet um, it's, it's quite prolific. I mean, I think in the last, um, this last year of 2018, I yeah. think over 40, 40 About 40, songs. 44 songs, just 2018, yeah. 44 songs coming through. <clears throat> Even Lennon and McCartney would go, whoa. Imagine having 44 hits come through <laughs> in, 
in one year. Wow, that would fill up a few albums. <laughs> but the thing about it is, is when you listen to Lennon and McCartney, they would talk about how they would kind of feed off of each other in the bedroom and the, all the collaboration that went in receiving those amazing love songs. And what we'd like to talk about a little bit today is that the main factor in undoing the doer is just the willingness, the willingness to be done through and the willingness to be undone. And so you've had quite a lot of experiences because going into 2018, it wasn't like Svava was preparing for her big year of uh, composing and a big year of receiving songs. She was licking her chops and using her hands going, here it comes, my big contribution to the sonship. Uh, actually, she had absolutely none of those thoughts. And maybe if we start off, you know, because it's quite a lot of songs, 44 <coughs> songs, but if we go back to the year before and just like where your state of mind was, uh, back there in 2017. Yeah, um, <clears throat> well maybe I should go a little bit further back okay. before I came to the community because <clears throat> yeah, I was <clears throat> um, maybe some of you have heard it, but I was very very shy, very afraid of people hiding. Um, I was a single mom and and I was uh, really, really trying to make it in the world, uh, but always something fell off. Um, so I tried different things and I always got so depressed. I even got like, I think, five different kinds of labels of mental illness. Diagnosis. Was diagnosis on all kinds of medication and everything. And I was like, uh, yeah, uh, down on my knees, basically and praying for something to save my life. And the course came in my life, just appeared to me on, on a screen. I wasn't really searching. And, um, and immediately Jesus started guiding me to unwind from even medication. I just hear it clearly. You can let this go and this go. This you have to unwind from. And I heard doses, everything was so clear and I, I don't know what it was, I just, I think I was just so, so willing to follow that I just did it. I just followed what Jesus wanted me to do and, and in five months I was out of everything and, and then I was on my knees and I said, Jesus, I'll do anything for you, anything. And uh, I think it was already that night I woke up and it was the first song I heard and I didn't know what was going on. And uh, <clears throat> yeah, and then Living Miracles came in my life. It just everything just started just coming and I was just, I was so willing. I was so, it was like, this was my lifeline. This was gonna save my life. And, uh, but I, I had no idea about, um, what was coming or anything, I just, I don't know. Maybe when I'm thinking about it, it felt like I was kind of clueless, like just totally surrendered to, because I didn't know what to do. And before we get too far too, I would like to take it nice and slow here, because I, I have to say that this is a very practical course. I've always found that the course is the most practical of teaching for me and it's and the guidance of the Holy Spirit to me is very practical and and honestly mm -hmm. I have to say that I do receive every week and I have received these emails and, and messages for weeks and months and years and actually decades I've been receiving emails where people are writing to me and they're they're saying things like I, I'm I'm feeling stuck. Like they'll they'll share their circumstances and then they'll share I'm feeling stuck. And sometimes it's they're feeling stuck in a relationship. Sometimes they're stuck, they say they're in, in stuck in a job or they're stuck in too much busyness. Their day is way too busy and they feel suffocated by the stress of just do, going from one busy doing to the next. 
Um, a lot of the emails I get too are, mm -hmm. are from people who are saying, um, listen, I'm trying to do the course, but I'm having trouble keeping my neck, my chin above the water. I am in a survival struggle. Uh, the wheels are coming off. I have prayed to Jesus and the Holy Spirit to take over my life. And then people will write me emails of my, I lost my job or my husband lost my job. I've, I've had, we, I was robbed. My house was burned down. My, you know, it, it just goes on and on and on of the things that people face that we could just call the human condition. And many of the struggles of the human condition are just for survival of the body. If we're honest, you know, that's what most of the huff and the puff is about. It's about survival of the body. So with, with Slava here and sharing her experiences, I, I think I don't want to gloss over the first part too fast and, and jump into living miracles because there's a lot there. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, <clears throat> when you were saying you had five diagnoses, and you were on multiple medications. Mm -hmm. That's something that people write to me when they've been diagnosed by counselors, psychologists, psychiatrists, and doctors, and they have single or multiple diagnosis. And then, of course, what do the doctors and the psychiatrists prescribe but the drugs? And uh, they may seem to, be, seem to be magical, like stabilizing some of the emotions a little bit, but also it's a deadening effect. People feel very pressed down and uh, caught in taking a lot of prescription drugs. And we have, you know, even in the United States, the op opioid crisis now and, and the young people, their drug addiction and these kind of things are on the rise. And it's part of the ego's plan of keeping the mind trapped in time and space and not knowing the creator. This is all part of of a designed system from the ego, a projection of an entire world, an entire time-space cosmos to keep you believing you're a tiny human being and, and not knowing your Christ self, your divinity. So let's go back mm. to that. So you, you had the multiple mm. diagnosis, you had, were taking lots of drugs, and it didn't, you probably didn't feel very empowered in that thing. And the other thing I think I remember mm. from talking to Slava at the beginning over when we met over in, uh, in um, Holland, Holland mm -hmm. was that she was saying she felt like she'd just been passed around from one social service agency to another. It's kind of a, a system where you have to go to one and, you, and they say, here are the rules. If you play by these rules, we'll give you money. We'll give you some disability money or some kind of, you know, every country has their own little system and game. And then you have to play the game, very much like when you're in school. You have to play by the rules. If you don't play by the rules of the teachers and the professors uh, and the principals, you know, you're, you're not going to go very far in that system. You know, you'll get spit out pretty quickly. You have to play by the rules. But in the social system of handling perceived problems, all perceived to be human problems, whether they're mental illness in private minds or whether it's physical ailments and diseases. So you felt, let's talk a little bit about that, you felt like you were passed around from taking exams, having to meet appointments, uh, having to do all these things, almost like play all the games of the social system. In this case mm -hmm. it was in, in Denmark, yeah. in uh, what was the, it's Copenhagen yeah. area. And so maybe you can share a little bit about the feelings you experience, because you're a mother mm. of two boys, and you're doing your best to raise them. You have an apartment mm. that you get some help, some help from your parents, and then you're going around from agency to agency, being told what you have, what's wrong with you, mm -hmm. uh, what you need to do to fix it, and of course, part of that is mm. having a job. You know that can be considered in this world of economic uh, advancement, if you don't have a job, what is the diagnosis in most social systems? You've got a big problem, especially if you seem to be able to work a little bit or able to work and function and you're not functioning in 
the systems of government that produce countries and gross national products and productivity bigger, better, mm -hmm. faster, more, more stuff, more buildings, more transportation systems, more everything, and then you don't have a job, then you are labeled uh, in some way, and then it's like, oh, poor baby. Now we've got to deal with this poor baby that is, has all these uh, disabilities and these diagnoses mm -hmm. and basically can't, can't seem to function. And so there's a stress that goes on. You were, if you could describe that a little bit, I think a lot of you can relate to that in your own ways. We don't want to gloss over mm -hmm. anything here. Yeah. Well, um, it went on this for like two decades. And um, in the beginning, I was like able to in the world pull myself together and go out and work maybe for six months or a year. And then I got so depressed. I, I, uh, I felt like I just didn't fit in the world. I just couldn't follow all these rules and people, everyone just like, like this doing their things and I just didn't understand anything and I was really really trying and trying but uh, and it went like had a job down depressed for some months or years up again it was like this for probably 15 years and um, and in the end it was just down 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 so I wasn't able to like pull myself together anymore and go out and work yeah. full so I got caught into the, in the system in Denmark. And their goal is to have functional citizens full-time work and go out. So their goal was always with me, pushing me and pushing me and pushing me, putting me in this program, this program. I was just thrown around and around in different uh, social workers. And it was just like a big mess. And in the end, I didn't really have anyone to connect with because you got to one appointment and the next one it's another one another one so I didn't have any it was just I was totally just lost in the system so let's, and, let's look at that so <clears throat> so there was a depression there but it wasn't as if you could really put a finger on what it is sometimes people call it a soul sickness like if you seem to have a soul sickness, or maybe you just feel like you don't fit into the world. I think a lot of us, probably most of us, if I asked the hands would go up, but most of us have had a sense sometimes of a soul sickness where it's like, do I really belong here? Is this really where I'm meant to be? Uh, is, is there something wrong with me? Uh, I'm not fitting in. Because, you know, it's one thing when you, when you you, you did clothing design, you've done many different jobs and, and mm -hmm. had highly developed skills in many areas. Mm -hmm. Also, when Slava was young, she was a very bright student, kind of like getting excellent grades. And so it wasn't a problem of, of kind of learning things in this world because you learned them mm -hmm. quite easily. You actually, at one point, I think, moved up to Aarhus. I know we got our Aarhus gang there with <laughs> Janice and Marianne and all of you, uh, she moved to Aarhus and she was part of a, it was like a mm. school, but it was a very athletic oriented school. Mm. And you loved athletics, so you, mm. were, you were smart, bright, athletic, uh, you excelled and loved to play football, soccer, and dance, and, dance yeah. and athletic movement and all these things. You notice, the more we're talking about this, she has the beginnings of someone who would really excel in this world. Bright, energetic, athletic, uh, very open, and yet she's describing two decades of kind of moving around, being passed around from institution to institution with, with these diagnoses because she's got some kind of a depression that, that nobody, the, the therapist of the world, can't put their finger on. Well, you should be able to work. You are very bright and skilled, so that's a problem. Uh, mm -hmm. You should be able to be happy and, and functional. That's what good productive citizens are. But there was like a soul sickness or some kind of depression that even with all the things that the world would say, you have all this going for you, mm. uh, it's, that the world would say it's mysterious that uh, 
that you felt so depressed. Mm -hmm. and, and yet you said this went on taking jobs, losing jobs, not really fitting in, not finding fulfillment. And maybe at the dance club a little bit. I think you might have found some joy at the dance club there. Started to yeah. feel a little more like, oh, I, I can handle this at the dance club. But ultimately, even that, you had to end up going to a dance club that was non-alcohol. I mean, it was, you know, <laughs> from eight to twelve. From eight to twelve <laughs> at night, and they had to all leave at twelve. That's the kind of dance club <laughs> that she ended up going to because she couldn't handle all the alcohol, all the game playing, all the pursuing and things that typically go on mm. with the dance club, but you like to dance. Yeah, I love so, to dance. So, so t take us from there. So, so two mm. decades of kind of being mm. diagnosed and dysfunctional and bouncing around, because I know a lot of you can relate to that, and, and a lot of you can say, well, I, I, it, it was a big struggle for me to achieve my career goals or to, to make it work and to really become a success in this world, but we're leading off, leading towards that point where Jesus completely takes over. And what I'm trying to establish here is it doesn't really matter what your history is. Even if you have a history of, of medications, of multiple diagnosis, of, of leaving jobs, even if you have a history of depression and everything, where we're going to go today is going to take you way, way, way beyond that perception of a life to something that's most extraordinary, most exquisite, unspeakable, uh, we're going there. But I don't want to gloss over the first part because most of you can, that's where your, a lot of your questions are, are right at this, uh, this level. Mm. Yeah. Well, I, I've always had this deep, deep calling in my heart for God. And since I was a child, I always talk to God and I talk to Jesus. I've not been raised Christian or anything, but somehow I, I just felt like this deep connection. Um, it was kind of natural for me. And um, so even through all these years of trying to make it in the world, and, but I, I, like, I, I couldn't figure out the way out. It was like something is off, but I don't know what to do. And the calling to God was so deep within me always. Mm. So I was, uh, yeah, I, I just had the desire to, to be happy, to change my life and be happy and do anything to be happy because yeah. it wasn't working. Yeah. I've been, yeah, suicidal too many, many times. So it, it was like, and when the course came, I was just, this is, this, is the, this is my last thing. It was like, if this doesn't work, nothing will work. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I also want to go back though, before we get into the course, before we get into the transformation, <laughs> let's go back. Okay, you were the single mother of, of two boys. What's yeah. your boys' names? Lucas and Oscar. Luz, Lucas and Os Oscar. Mm. And so, for me, when I hear the story of the parable of your life, I see uh, just like Eska being given an opportunity to teach English in Japan from nine in the morning till nine at night and just pouring her heart into it and blessing the whole universe and cracking wide open through doing that, through doing something that she's guided to do and love to do. You, you were given mm -hmm. the gift of two boys and so you raised them. How did you raise them? Did you raise them like typical parents with rules and regulations, with all kinds of uh, must and do, have to's, should to, ought to, rules, uh, restrictions, mm. the typical way of raising them? Or were, were they a gift to you in a different way? Did they offer you an opportunity to love unconditionally and to teach what you would learn? Because that's what Ask is doing when she's teaching English. She's just teaching what she would learn, love. So I, I think this is a, an aspect we can't gloss over that either, mm. is, is did the Holy Spirit use the mother concept to crack your heart wide open? Yeah, yeah. The Holy Spirit did do that. Um, I, um, I don't know, I, I never really knew, I don't know, I kind of, when I think about it, I was kind of 
very clueless, but I just had so much love. So, and I always taught them to, yeah, that they are beautiful and they are amazing and and I always told them that life is about being happy, even though I wasn't, but it was like my desire. So these are like twin boys. So when you get, have twins, how many of you have raised one, but now you've got raising twins, okay. Some of you can relate to that. About, did you buy a stroller that both of them could be in? Did you dress them identical like most parents do? Did you have them wear the same kind of things? Tell us some of the details yeah. of what happened when, when these twins came into your life. Yeah, well, I did not dress them the same at all. Okay, uh, uniquely different. Interesting <laughs> expression there. Dressing the twins uniquely different. That's interesting. Yeah, it was actually, I don't know, it was very important to me that that they didn't wear the same. Um, and uh, they went to uh, different classes in school. I, I asked for that, so they had their own like friends and yeah, grew up to feel, to be themselves. Um, yeah, I don't really know what to say more. I because they, they seem to be, even though they're twins, they seem to look different. Mm. They had yeah. very different personalities, very different skill sets. Mm. But the opportunity <laughs> to love was the same. Opportunity to love unconditionally, to honor, to respect, to listen to them mm. in their emotions, to allow them to express emotions. All the stuff we talk about in community, expressing emotions, respecting, listening, having conversations that are very respectful and talking things through, that was all part of it. In fact, I would say you love them so well that when it came time for you, some of you have heard the dramatic uh, story of when she was praying and meditating and the, mm. was going to blow out a candle and the candle wax yeah, the came wax down. deleted me from the photo. Deleted uh, you from the photo, which mm -hmm. was, is quite a strong symbol of you're ready for your next phase now. Yeah in service of Jesus, but, but to me it's kind of interesting that, mm. that when you told them that you would be leaving them mm. at 15. Yeah, they were 15. At 15 yeah. years old, their reaction was, go mom. Mom, you gotta go. So that tells you <laughs> something about the teaching that must have occurred in those 15 years. When you get a reflection back from teenagers, go mom, <laughs> go for it. You always taught us to follow our hearts, now you have to follow your heart. The, to me, there's some definite, it's, it's how was the mom concept used? Was it used to reinforce a separate identity? Was it used for specialness or was it used to teach unconditional love? It's not so much what you do that's important. It's not so much what you produce in this world or the outcomes you achieve. It's all about the love. In fact, if you could have Jesus whispering in your ear, he would just keep whispering to you through your entire lifetime. It's all about the love, baby. Never forget that. It's all about the love. It's about nothing else but the love, baby. You know, that's what Jesus would be whispering and telling you. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to bring that out because it's not that uh, you had a self-concept where you just couldn't handle parenting because it seems like you handled that so exquisitely that you got the reflection back mm. like thank you we love you now go for it like this the same thing you gave us permission to do now you do because yeah. they're quite amazing young men too they're quite yeah. uh, in the flow they are they are not like going through huge issues and problems mm. they're thriving now mm. because of those 15 years so I think we can't gloss over the positive aspects, even though she was diagnosed, even though she couldn't hold jobs down, even though there were all these people telling her there's something wrong, she was in tune with a function and she was fulfilling that function of letting the mom concept be used to undo the, con the self-concepts of, of this world. That's mm -hmm. really important. Yeah. So now let's Let's move on. When you first picked up the course, you picked up the course in what language? In Danish. In Danish? Yeah, and I just opened the book and I heard, no, you have to read this book in English. 
And I was just like, okay. And I just, I don't know, I just closed it and I, and I ordered it, it in English. English. You ordered it. Yeah. And then English is not your first language by far. It's, no, it's the third. It's the third language. Icelandic, <laughs> first language. Second language is Dutch. No, Danish. Danish, I mean. Danish. <laughs> D, I get my D. D's confused. David, <laughs> Dutch, Danish. It's okay. Second one is Danish. And then, so now the guidance, the internal prompt is like, read the book in your third language. And when you're reading mm -hmm. this book, there's some three and four syllable words. You know, Helen Shuckman, the scribe of the course, brought through, she was a very much mm -hmm. of an intellect. So I had a friend years ago, Dorothy, too, who I met, who was one of the most happy, joyful, loving people I've ever met. She didn't even finish high school. And she stayed up at the Foundation for A Course in Miracles with Ken Wabnick and Gloria and all these PhDs that were up there. And when she would read the course, uh, she would open it up and I would say to her, just a practical question, what do you do when you're reading the course and you get to a, a three or four syllable word that you don't know the meaning of? And she laughed and she went, oh, I just asked the Holy Spirit and he gives me a smaller word that means the same thing. <laughs> so much for intellectualism and awakening. So much for guidance and all these people who study the Course and become scholars of the Course and dissect the Course and analyze the Course. This is a simple course in practical application. And if you are not applying the principles, I mean to everything, including the words of the Course, you remember Lesson 189, forget this world, forget this course, and come with holy empty hands unto your God. Jesus means it. So what we're talking about here is that the spiritual awakening is not necessarily an awakening of words. You're not necessarily going to go back to Jesus through the words. Some people actually believe that, and the scribes and the Pharisees of 2,000 years ago actually believed that as well. But we're going to try to dispel a lot of these things that people really need to hear this because this is an awakening that is based on guidance like I was talking about yesterday. Not on words, but on guidance, listening and following to the guidance. So what, first the Danish book, then you're asked to, to read it <laughs> in, English. in English, okay, your third language, yeah. and then what do you end up doing? Like Dorothy uh, would ask for for help, and she would get smaller words that meant the same thing as the bigger words. But what well, was your process? Did you have to? Did you look up? I had to use Google Translate. Okay, Google Translate. You, you, you're guided to do the book, so she's she's using Google Translate now. Okay, that's yeah. good. That's. Good and it took know. me so long time just to read one page. It's not just looking up the words, but also just the book was just in such a different language that I I had no past experience with. I haven't really read the Bible and anything, so it was very unfamiliar. So yeah, I, but I was so determined. I was just so determined to follow what I had heard. Okay, so I think what we're establishing here is it's not the circumstances. Lainey, it's so beautiful. You're so transparent mm -hmm. about your situation with working a job, with the children, with handling things at home. And believe me, when I first started teaching the course and people showed up to me to say, uh, I'm here to be your student, I said, well, tell me about yourself. Well, I'm a mother. I've got a husband that I have trouble with. <laughs> I've got children to deal with. I've got a job to deal with. I have no time in my, my day to read the course, a very little time to practice the course. And they were telling me as if like my, my circumstances are not conducive to A Course in Miracles. And actually they told me my circumstances are not con conducive to spiritual awakening. And I would say, well, wait a minute. It doesn't seem like spiritual awakening would have more or less favorable circumstances because it's all thoughts in the mind. The circumstances are, are neutral. It can't mean that the circumstances are good. Because people would tell me, you know, yeah, you tried doing the course, David, if you're like a single mom and you've got multiple five diagnoses, you've got no money coming in except from the government and you have to play all these games and jump all these hoops. Oh, you tried doing the course with those kind of circumstances. What we're going to show today is those circumstances didn't hold Svava back at all from her calling. 
She did not let single mom hold her back. She did not let lack of money hold her back. She did not let being told internally that she was to read the Course in English in her third language. That would be like telling me, David, read the Course in, in Polish. I would need Carolina's help there, yeah. a, a lot of help. She'd have to be my, uh, my mate to get me through that because if, if I heard read the course in Polish, I would be like, oh, God. <laughs> you know, but she actually bought the book in English and then used Google Translate. So let's move ahead then from that because, because you're working with that. But I would say you would probably say that the course itself, even though the course has been helpful, it's not like you took on the course like Robert Perry took on the course, or you took on the course like Ken Wapnick took on the course. You wouldn't consider yourself a course scholar at all. No. no. In fact, even when you sit here and you listen to Kristen Express and you listen to Emily Express, you, you just watch them and you just see them articulate uh, so amazingly. And then what's the inner voice say? to you when you watch those amazing articulations. Yeah, I was just thinking, oh wow, I would never be able to, to do it in that way. And, uh, and my mind would start thinking, oh, like going to, oh, you're someone worth it, you're not good enough. Or, but then I heard, Svava, this is not your path. So it's not, mine is more like experiencing it. Even, even when I was reading the Course in the beginning, I would misunderstood, misunderstand because I didn't know English so well. And even that got used because then I got angry. Like, and it was not even, then I could read it later and it wasn't even how it was, how it was written. But I just went through some issues even using m me misunderstanding the English. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So. I know for myself, you know, the course has been a slowly evolving curriculum. You know, people ask me and, and I say, I came across the course in 1986 and then Jesus worked with me very meticulously, very slowly, washing away uh, as much as I would let him wash away in my mind. Um, actually now that's going on decades of letting Jesus rinse, rinse, power rinse, wash, wash, get every little piece of darkness, you know, washed away. And, and yet what we're talking about with Svava here is, is here's somebody who, when did you pick up the course for the first time? What year? 2016. 2016. Okay. So I picked up the course in 1986. Svava picked up the course in 2016. Again, I remind you, over the last year she's taken down 44 songs from Jesus. Uh, words and melodies and that is a direct connection with Jesus. Any of you who have even tried to write songs or put a melody together and you can hear the final vision harmonizing on these songs, these are, are amazing. They're blessing all of us, they're blessing the whole Sonship because they're so healing. It's like a huge transmission coming through. So you picked up the course in 2016 <clears throat> First in Danish, then you tried it your best, and so that's 2016, and mm -hmm. we just turned days ago into 2019. So 2016, 2017, and 2018. In three years there has been so much of an undoing of the doer, and what we all would like to discover is we want to know a little bit more about how for many of us, I know many of you have worked with the book for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 or more years and are still dealing with these day-to-day -day issues. And here is a, is a witness of undoing the doer in, we'll say, three years. So what was it? We're going to zoom in on this. What actually is it? Because what I talked about yesterday was how important guidance was. So let's talk a bit about that. If the pathway hasn't really been, you have been reading the Course some, but actually yours is more of an intrinsic pathway of, of guidance. Um, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your relationship to Jesus and how that communication seems to go and, 
and have you seen Jesus? Does Jesus appear to you? Tell us about those things because that might help us explain mm -hmm. a little bit <laughs> if we knew a little bit more about that connection with Jesus. Because I would say that's the most important factor. The books, all the other stuff of the world, even relationships and all the signs and symbols of the world, if you have a direct connection to Jesus, to the way shower, to the way, the truth, and the life, to the one who has transcended the ego entirely, and you have a connection where you can actually hear that voice and listen and follow to that voice and occasionally when you're really frightened have Jesus visually appear to you, I would say that's going to be more mm. of a factor than the words of A Course in Miracles, I think. Mm. Yeah, well like I was <clears throat> talked a little bit about, I, I've always felt, I don't know why, but I always felt this deep connection with Jesus and I was talking to Jesus when I was a child too. And I was very, very shy, so it was like my, Jesus was my, sa my safety net. Um, and, um, <clears throat> but it's like after the Course came in my life, I've been hearing more clearly guidance. And I, um, I hear, it's like, it's not with my ears, but it's like to my mind. And he speaks in sentences, sometimes he just says a word. And he, yeah, and he guides me through all the issues and darkness, and and I, um, I think I, what it is for me that I, I just totally, totally trust everything that he says to me, and I just, I just do what he says to me, even though sometimes he can be very firm, and and I'm like, no, I don't want to do that, but. <clears throat> But it's, I, I just know in my heart that it's my way out to follow. And, uh, and yes, he has appeared to me sometimes, and that has been where, where I was at kind of crossroads, and it was very, very important that I got the message. Um, like when I met you, uh, he appeared to me. And I was so afraid to talk to you. and. Uh, and he appeared to me and said, Svava, whatever happens, I'm always with you. And, um, and I just knew that, that it was okay to, to speak from my heart and just to share what was going on and what I needed to say. And, and that, that moment there just changed my life. I, uh, and he just guided me to unwind from everything and, and so beautifully. It was everything was so, so given and so, it was so effortless. Like, um, like with my boys and I had two cats too. And I didn't even had to ask anyone. My parents came and said, we want to take your cats. And I was, oh wow, thank you. I didn't even have to think about that. And, yeah, so it's been like, it's hard to explain, mm -hmm. just a deep, deep willingness to just be a tool for Jesus and just follow. Yeah, we can maybe we'll give some specific examples because I know a lot of you have worked with the Course, you know, Jesus says mm -hmm. in the workbook that the Holy Spirit must work with specifics in order to undo your belief in them. So a lot of times I hear people say, all is God, all is one, love is all, and you know, it's la da 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 but, but they still have a lot of belief in specific issues, specific relationship issues with children or partners, specific financial issues around not having money or bills or investments or strategies. They still have specific issues with the environment, allergies seemingly, or uh, anger at political leaders, presidents and so forth. They still have a lot of specific issues that they haven't addressed and they've been using the Course of Miracle Principles to metaphysically ghost over those unconscious beliefs without bringing them to the light, without bringing them to Jesus from the bottom up, as, as Jason says, 
if you don't do that, then all that glossing over with all that pretty spiritual phraseology is like putting icing on a cake of mud. You know, if you keep just taking the top of the cake and getting the icing, you can keep fooling yourself that things are sweet. But unless you dip down under that icing and get your finger down in some of that mud and actually push the icing away and say, Jesus, oh that's right, your course is about bringing the darkness to the light. Your course is about exposing the beliefs, exposing these thoughts, expose, exposing these self-concepts. If I'm just using affirmations and I'm just using the course to just play around with my finger with the, the, the sweet icing on top of the cake, then you should know why you're not experiencing consistent peace because you're not doing the course as it was intended. You're misusing the course. The ego is trying to use the course to keep hidden, to keep covered up. So I think one thing that has really come to me is you also remember from reading the course where Jesus says, you know, Jesus was the first to complete his part in the plan of atonement and now he is in charge of the plan. Jesus also says in the Course that he can work miracles indiscriminately. That basically all we're to do is to ask Jesus, how would you have me serve? What would you have me do? And Jesus says, I will perform miracles through you. And, and Jesus can perform them indiscriminately Jesus, because Jesus knows where in the plan they would be most helpful, where your strengths would be most helpful. He's got the bird's eye view, so to speak, the spirit's eye view of everything and can use miracles in a constructive way to heal as many errors and clear as many errors away for the entire sonship if you will allow your mind to be under his direction. So in other words, doing the course is one thing, but if you look back at the history of Christianity where there was no Course in Miracles, did Saint Teresa of Avila have a Course in Miracles? No. Did Saint Francis of Assisi have a Course in Miracles? No. You know, did, did uh, Meister Eckert have a Course in Miracles? No. Did Mary Baker Eddy have a Course in Miracles? No. <laughs> I mean, I could go on <laughs> for, for 20 minutes to tell you of all the mystics and saints who did not have the benefit of A Course in Miracles, and yet did they lead very expansive, mystical, heart-opening, mind-opening lives? Yes, they did. And what were they using? Many of them were using the Bible. It always fascinates me when I hear Course in Miracles students being so critical of the Bible, when there's so many mystics and saints that use nothing but the Bible and prayer to reach a state of beautiful union with God. So, uh, you know, again, this is an ego attempt at trying to project out onto the form. And in Svava's case, you know, since Jesus is in charge of the plan of atonement and she was so willing to just listen and follow what Jesus was saying, that's the fast track. That's faster than sitting there and let your little human eyeballs move over the course for 25 years and chit chat about it when you, there's a direct connection with Jesus Christ that's available to everyone and if you plug into that, that voice will tell you, I've got it. I will handle everything for you. If you'll serve me, that voice will tell you, I will handle your relationships, I will handle your body, I will handle your health issues, I will handle your financial issues, I will handle your educational issues, I will handle everything that you're concerned about in time and space if you will simply just listen and follow to me and follow my instructions. You see how fast that is of a fast track? Because then you don't have to spend all this time figuring out how you're going to pay the bills, how you're going to cut the grass, how you're going to do the dishes, how you're going to feed the children, how you're going to handle that doctorate thesis, how you're going to handle that uh, leaky roof and, or leaky pipes, you know, the, there are many problems on the level of form that will just distract you away from really your one requirement which is simply to tune in and listen to the way shower who has transcended time and space and let the way shower direct you in very specific ways of how to collapse time for everybody. You see the difference there between just 
reading the course and going through this intellectually versus actually going into the goal of the course, which is to forgive under direct guidance of Jesus and the Holy Spirit and then to come to the happy dream. If you want a realistic goal, the happy dream is a good one. <laughs> you know, that's, that's what to be sh shooting for. So let's, let's talk about it more specifically though. Maybe, um, maybe we could go back. Uh, you were going to come to a retreat, mm -hmm. like a five-day retreat over yeah, in Holland. in Holland. And you <clears throat> were going to register. Yeah, I, um, I, I wasn't really looking for anything, but somehow it just appeared on the screen, the retreat in Holland. Uh, and uh, I, it, was, it was so deep for me because it was like I had already been there. And um, so I, I signed up for it. But then a week later, I started getting so much fear and doubt and, no, I can't do this. And I tried to cancel it. I sent a cancellation email for the or to the organizer. But I never heard anything back. And um, so I thought, well, I'm supposed to go. This must be because I'm supposed to go. And I was so afraid because I, um, I had never traveled on my own or anything and I had to fly from Copenhagen to Amsterdam and take two different trains and a bus. And, uh, and I had everything planned because I was so fearful. I, so I knew when the plane would land and which train to take and which platform I was Googling on in in, in uh, Holland, how things work there, and a bus and everything. And, and then my plane was delayed. And uh, I, I freaked out. And I was sitting on the plane, and I was so scared. What am I going to do now? The whole plan is just wiped out. And I prayed, and I prayed, and I prayed. And uh, a huge miracle happened when the plane landed. So all this fear, suddenly it was like, this flip around and I was just so excited I was just like oh my god I'm, I made it I made it I'm here and and me that I I never really spoke much to people I was so scared and definitely not, not strangers and seemingly and on the plane I started talking to people and asking them how I get there and I had the address and so many angels. There was this man, oh, my parents live there, and you just do this and this, and people helping me buying the tickets for the trains and where to go. And it was, I was like, oh my God, oh my God. It was like this joy and excitement. I, well, some, somewhere I recognized it from my true, my true self, but it has been away for so many years, and I was just, oh, wow. <laughs> Oh, wow. <laughs> so I think the, the good point of that parable, too, is so beautiful, is that how many of us have, have turned to technology like Google Maps, like emails, like messaging, like all the things that a smartphone seems, it's like, it's like a little supercomputer in our hands. You know, human beings are becoming quite attached to these little devices now, I'm noticing some of us. And the interesting thing is, is when your technology shuts down, when your plane is delayed, when all your pre-printed pre maps are out the window, uh, then basically you actually are brought, put into a position where you have to rely on spirit. And as you went from like great fear on the plane to suddenly great joy, and then yeah. every door opened, including arriving at the, the retreat center in the, in the, at night, in the dark. Yeah. Where you had to get off of the final, was it a train or a bus? It, it was a bus. Off the and, bus, yeah. and in the dark, in a country where you don't speak the language, in rural Holland, <laughs> Way and you're just dropped out there, and then what? The Holy Spirit comes yeah. through for you when you're just in the dark, and you've just gotten off a bus at yeah. some distance to you don't even know where. Yeah, I was just, I got off the bus and was standing on the sidewalk with my, my back and I was, okay, Jesus, what now? And then I heard, turn around, go to the house behind you and knock on the door. And I turned around and there was light, in, like in the living room in this house behind me. 
So I, okay, I'll do that. I went, knocked on the door, and this adorable elderly couple opened the door. They did not speak any English, just Dutch. And, uh, <clears throat> and I was trying to explain, I'm going there. And then I picked up the address, and we were like talking like this and trying. And, uh, and then the sweet man, he, he drew a map for me where to go and how to get up there. And, and, uh, and then he decided to walk with me uh, some of the way. In and, the he, dark. and he was holding my back and everything. Carrying your bag carrying my in bag. the dark. Yeah. In a country where you never have visited and you don't speak the language. No, yeah. I rest my case. <laughs> Those of you who, who, who want to go this, this route, you can try. <laughs> But it could be a lot slower. But I'm, I'm telling you, that's the first example. We're going to continue on here. But, but this way of trying to do it the human way and struggling and fighting and resisting and hacking and choking and spitting, there is another way. This need not be. And we want to explore that. So, so you make it there in, in the night. And you, you meet these people at the retreat center. And you have a, a big joyful. Yeah, experience. and I was so surprised because I walked in this cafeteria, there were like eight or ten people that had arrived the day before. It was Sunday evening and the retreat started Monday. And I was just in so much joy, I just came in there and I just said, is this the retreat with David Hofmeister? And everyone was like, yeah, and we were just in so much joy and they were like, do you want coffee? And it was just, I was just like, oh my God, what's happening to me? I used to be so shy and hiding and so much in fear and it was all gone there. I was just like, oh, this is a miracle. My life, my life is not what I thought it was. It was amazing. Yeah. yeah. That, that reminds me of that thing that those who are meant to meet will meet. Like it's all part of a prearranged plan. And when we actually start to trust and let go of trying to control it, you are trying to cancel the whole retreat. Yeah. It got lost in the mail. I think Jesus intercepted your, your email. <laughs> yeah. There's a pass from Swava. She's going to the organizer to, to shut down, not go to the thing. It's intercepted. Some <laughs> invisible force has picked off the pass and, and run the other way with it and never to be seen again. So, so Jesus picks off the, the, the cancellation pass gets you there in the middle of the night into mm -hmm. rural Holland where you don't even speak the language. Now you're loved, everyone's cheering, holding, hugging you, and yeah. have some coffee. So then let's, ha let's get more into the specifics. So, mm. you know, we have, a, it's an amazing retreat. It's a five-day retreat. I have to say, I've never seen people change their minds so much in five days. We had a couple movies, Her and The Beauty, Inside. inside and it just cracked everybody open and everybody went from kind of an intellectual grasp of the course to and quite quite closed actually to at the end of five days they were running around like children in in the woods like little children gleeful children like a lot of them how many were there it was like 57 57 of them running around through the woods like little children at preschool that had been turned loose just in total glee uh, from these five days. It was huge. It was like a revival. It was like a total transformation of consciousness that occurred in those five days. But let's get mm. into the specifics because that's what guidance is. It's specific. So mm. you wanted to do a one-on-one -on -one with me. No, I didn't. You didn't? You didn't want to do <laughs> a one-on-one. Jesus -on -one. said I had to speak to you. Oh, Jesus told you that? Yeah. Okay. And I said, I can't do that. No, I'm just going to hide here in the group. But it was so, he was so firm, you have to have a session with David. And, uh, and I think it was the second day there. I said, okay, if I'm supposed to have a session with David, you have to organize it for me. And I said, I'm going to go out for a walk now. And if I meet David, then okay. But if not, then... I don't, yeah, I don't really, 
when oh, I do were, that. You were bargaining I was Jesus. bargaining with Jesus. <laughs> we would like to know what our relationship <laughs> is. Have any of you ever done that? Bargain with Jesus a little bit like, okay, I'm willing, but uh, here are my conditions, Jesus. <laughs> you pay off my mortgage. You handle this, this, this. this. I'll give you 10 criteria. You do good with those 10 then I'll give you a shot. Yeah. But so you but did a little bit. When I went out for a walk yeah. and I didn't meet you. So I thought, hmm, it's not gonna happen. I I did it, I did, I went out. But then You fulfilled your I end feel, of the bargain. I you took a walk <laughs> in the woods yeah. and said, All right Jesus, you didn't make yeah. it there. <laughs> but then in the evening <clears throat> there was a movie session and I walked in and I sat I was there a bit early, I sat in the front row and uh, and then you came in and walked and walked into the room next door where there were books and everything. Um, yeah, your books. Mm -hmm. And then Jesus said, now I have organized it for you. Now you go and speak to David. And I said, no way. And I was just holding on to the chair. I didn't want to go. And then I heard, it's now. And my legs just started walking, and I was just suddenly standing in front of you. So you got, it seems like you got a little pushed. I got pushed. At, you were pushed out of the chair. Yeah. Now, see, some of you think Jesus is never firm. Oh, <laughs> when Jesus says, I have arranged it for you, it is now, and then <laughs> you get the push. Uh, that happens. It happened to me a lot. I don't know about a lot of you, but I know in my life, I would get right to these precipices where I'm kind of like, and then it would get this feeling, the same thing. It is now. You will speak this. You will speak this to your advisor, your grad school advisor, after you've been in, in grad school for two years on a full scholarship. I'm leaving the program. You will deliver this message and now. <laughs> Here, on, on cue, right now. And it's, and it's all for me, even though there was enormous resistance and you had pretty much, you were like saying, no, no, I didn't see him on the walk last night in the woods, and now, <laughs> and then before you know it, you're out of the chair, the legs are walking, so, yeah. okay, go up from there. We're excited <laughs> to hear how these things work, because this is showing us uh, how it works with Jesus. Mm -hmm. we, we want to know how, how does Jesus work. You know, the, we, need, we need witnesses. We know there's no formula, but we do need witnesses to help us have the strength to listen mm -hmm. and to follow. That's what this is really all about. Yeah. Well, then I was standing in front of you and I somehow said like, uh, could I have a session with you? Like, try, I was, I, I remember my, my, my voice was shaking and, and you were just so loving and kind, just, yes, of course. And, and then, uh, yeah, and we saw the movie and everything. And then <clears throat> the next day I was still trying to hide, like, Oh, maybe it's not going to happen. And you said to meet me after lunch. And <clears throat> yeah. And then we went and sat outside. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It just, I, I remember I just talked and talked and talked. And two and a half hours went by. And like time just disappeared. And when I was talking to you, <clears throat> Jesus was speaking to me too to tell me what to ask you. And um, <clears throat> I remember that uh, he was saying, ask him about the ring. Ask him about the ring. I was, no way I'm not going to ask him about this, the ring. And uh, At the time I was wearing a ring. Yeah. yeah. And, um, <clears throat> and then I remembered way, way back um, Jesus uh, appeared to me and he had a golden ring and I asked Jesus what is this ring for and and he said it's my commitment to God and uh, then instead of asking you what is this ring I just shared I, it just came in my mind I remembered this so I shared with you um, this experience and then I asked you what your ring meant and you said the same, as Jesus has said to me. Um, yeah. But during our talk, I had like this, 
yeah, this amazing explosion of love just pouring out. It was just, I, I didn't know what was happening. It was just like, like all the love, like God's love, universal love just like started floating out of me. And I was in so much joy and I just felt like I, I had known you all my life. Like you were, you were me, like, and such a beautiful reflection of, of the truth, the truth in me, yeah. And, uh, yeah, and then after our session, I, I went to my room and, yeah, the other thing was I was supposed to have a roommate. I said to Jesus, well, I want to go all the way. I have a roommate and everything. And, but I never got any roommate. I think it was because I was so willing that it was not needed. or I don't know. But <clears throat> I went to my room and I didn't sleep all night. And I, I just felt that I had to share with you that I had so much love for you. And, uh, and the melody started playing in my mind, this melody over and over with Barbara Streisand and I think Donna Summer tell him uh, such a beautiful or Celine so, Dion maybe or maybe Celine Dion and Barbara Streisand yeah and uh, <clears throat> in the morning I had not slept the whole night and in the morning I Jesus said I had to tell you that I had all this love for you and I was I can't do that I don't going to do that this is how Jesus works. First, he pushes you out of the chair to get a talk, and then the next day, tell him. Remember that song that Barbara Streisand <laughs> said? That's working pretty fast, but you see, Jesus has an important plan, so he's not kind of into dilly-dallying and, and delay. So, so that, was, that was powerful, too, as well. Yeah. So I, um, I message you something like, I need to tell you something very important. And then I wrote, just before I leave. It was not like, mm -hmm. yeah. And then you wrote back to me um, that you could meet me before breakfast. And I was just like, oh no. And then you came to my room. And that was before you came. I was in so much fear and I was in so much doubt. And I was so afraid of rejection. I was so afraid of 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 sharing all this like i was afraid of being like shut down and done wrong or but it was like my past learning um and i uh, yeah and then jesus showed up in on the next bed where i was supposed to have a, a roommate where i was supposed to be <laughs> somebody was supposed to be yeah and uh, and then he said to me whatever happens i'm always with you and uh, and it relaxed me so much that, okay, uh, Jesus is always there. <laughs> I, I can't lose anything. Jesus is always here. And, uh, and then you came in the room and it just like, I don't know, it just came out of my mouth without me really planning anything. And I just said, I'm in love with you. <laughs> yeah. And then I shared just what had happened all night and the song and everything and yeah and I didn't reject you no you didn't <laughs> well Jesus is in charge you know that's the whole thing every single step is to build strength and faith in the divine and listen follow listen follow yeah and I think a lot of us watched the remember the first matrix movie where Neo is working in his cubicle and he's just sitting there in a, with a blank screen and then his little, remember those little flip phones? The phone rings and it, it flips open mm -hmm. and he goes, hello? And, and it's Morpheus. And you remember that scene with the cubicles where he's, he says, I can guide you but you must do exactly as I say. Stand up. Do it slowly. There's a cubicle across the hall where you'll be, you know, okay. Go now. You see, see the precision. Go now. 
it's the guidance is perfectly timed by the spirit that knows, that's transcended time and space and knows exactly what you're to do, where you're to go, what you're to say, that's in your mind telling you when you have thoughts, how to deal with these thoughts, that's teaching you, instructing you internally how to forgive. And if you're too resistant to hearing that voice, then you have the Course. The Course is, is a beautiful, like, direct pathway where you're given exactly what you need. And he says this Course has everything that you need. He also says that the Course is only one path of many, but he says this is a Course in saving time. And he does say this Course has everything that you need. I would say that's a reflection of, of him saying, Spirit, Jesus saying, I have everything that you need. I can guide you and direct you beyond time and space. I can take you out of the maze of duality and multiplicity. I can bring you home to heaven because I've done it. I'm, I'm speaking to you from heaven or through the Holy Spirit. Now the voice of Jesus and the Holy Spirit are one, are completely unified. And I can guide you, but you must do exactly as I say. So the key thing I think here is, in undoing the doer, is we're not on here to talk about a bunch of different formulas. We're not on here to talk about a bunch of different factors. We're, we're here to say that you have a very powerful mind and you can be guided precisely, specifically, by Jesus, by the Holy Spirit, to unwind from all ego thoughts and beliefs and reach a place of atonement. And that this is the most important thing. Everything else pales. If you just connect with that guidance and you follow that, you are home free. There is nothing the ego can do to prevent you from waking up to, to know who you are, to know thyself, to know God, to know oneness. But it, it requires that listen and follow. And that's what everything, our community is about. Everything's about witnessing that it's possible. Coming to that happiness, coming to that joy, coming to that surrender. You know, I, I had some tears come to mind this morning because I was sitting there and I woke up and I was just sitting there and then all of a sudden, has anybody heard of Cliff Richard? Cliff Richard the singer? All of a sudden, Cliff Richard is singing in my mind. Came a time in my life, I had to be free from all of the lies that used to be me. And the only way out is the only way in, and it's you. I've been wasting my time, but not anymore. Cause I've met, been through the maze and it led to your door. And the only way out is the only way in and it's you. I've been a life, spent a lifetime at the crossroads, getting that lonely feeling inside. But suddenly you made the rescue, you pulled me through. Now let me do something for you. Let's get this thing going, let's move it along. Let me do all the things I've been missing so long. Cause the only way out is the only way in and it's you. The only way out of the maze of time and space, the only way out of the struggle, the only way out of the confusion is the only way into the kingdom of heaven. The only way out is the only way in. And it's you. Who is the you? It's the way, the truth, and the life speaking to you, speaking through you, shining through you, smiling through you, laughing through you, bringing love, gratitude, joy, and inspiration. It's the way shower. It's, if you were caught in a maze, if you were lost and you didn't know how to get out of being lost, why wouldn't you turn to one who is found? Why wouldn't you turn to the one who found the way? 
you know, sometimes people say, oh, I don't, I don't like that. I mean, I didn't even like that. When I was in Christianity, Bible school, I would read, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And I'd say, oh, I don't know, that's a bit arrogant. And then suddenly, suddenly, you made the rescue. You pulled me through. Suddenly I realized that that was the universal spirit speaking. That was the Holy Spirit. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Oh my gosh! That's not a man or a woman. That's not a form in time and space. That's the eternal spirit inviting me to remember God. Wow! I'm like, wow! So, I mean, I had some tears this morning as Cliff Richard <laughs> was in my mind. I think I start crying when I, when I get to the part, but suddenly you made the rescue. You pulled me through. Now let me do something for you. That's why I'm having a ball going to 40 some countries. That's why I like to sing. That's why I like to express. It's not David. It's, it's the universal spirit that is saying, come home, my beloved, come home. Let us rejoice. Let us rejoice together. Let us rejoice in a happy dream of non-judgment. Let us be of good cheer. For the Christ has overcome the world. The Christ has transcended this dark, deceived world of time and space. The Christ is real. The Christ is true. And our happiness is how we demonstrate that. It's just by being happy that you demonstrate the Kingdom of Heaven. You know, you know there's some lines in the Bible about um, God is not mocked. God, believe me, God is not mocked. It's like there is no sense of, of error that's in form. It's just in the mind. When you believe you're something that you're not, you set up a condition of fear which is completely unreal. Absolutely unreal. And from a condition of fear comes, projects an unreal world. And then when you have that fear in your mind and it's buried, it's unconscious, then you just simply react and respond to the dream characters. You believe you're lacking? You better do what the boss says because the boss will fire you. What happens if you get fired? Well, you don't have a paycheck. What happens if you have no paycheck? You can't pay the mortgage, you can't pay the bills. You see how it's all, the whole world is based on fear of consequences. But when you accept, when you just, in, the, in your heart of hearts, just say, Jesus, I'm here, I'm yours. I'm giving you my life, I'm giving you my mind. You, you run the show. And some of you may say, I don't know, it's a, little bit, it's a little bit scary to say, I give you control of my heart. I give you control of my mind. Use me. If that feels scary to you, it's just the ego recoiling because it wants a personality self, it wants a separate identity more than, it doesn't even know that there is such a thing as, as God. The ego just thinks there's something above it, but it doesn't even know what that something is. The ego is just focused on the form, just focused on the image, just focused on outcomes, on getting, on controlling, on manipulating. That's all the ego knows. And you are worth more than, that, than believing in that ego. You can be free. So this is what this morning session really is. It's like really conveying that, like through the examples that Svava was sharing, that it's not like she had what the world, some people call the best conditions, being a, a single mom, being on, diagnosed, being on medication. And this was for years, so this is, and then three years ago, discovering A Course in Miracles, and then starting to hear that, that, that experience of Jesus guiding you stronger and stronger. Mm -hmm. And then simply somewhere deep, somewhere deep inside you must have said to Jesus, I trust you, I love you, I will follow you. Mm -hmm. Because something ignited something for her to receive like 40 songs in 2018. Amazing! songs that bless all of us. They're, the gifts, the fruits are starting to come, mm. but there had to be something in the mind that preceded that, and that was just, a, I think, a big yes. Like yeah. a big, big yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, I just felt deeply that I, I'll, I'll do anything, anything for Jesus. Just like, use me, guide me, I'll do anything. And I had not planned of writing songs, singing in front of people. I have had so much resistance about all this because, <clears throat> like I said, I was shy, hiding it. I had never imagined me, you know, even sitting here and speaking or singing songs or receiving songs and <clears throat> yeah, it's like it feels so deeply that my, the personal svava is just being washed away with this and all these, receiving these songs have been for me for the undoing of all kinds of beliefs, being unworthy, not good enough, not even, yeah. And also resistance about what is this, I, I don't want to be a songwriter. I don't want to be anything in this world. I don't want to be a singer. So that came in too. I, I didn't want it. Like, I, you have the wrong person. I, I don't even know what I'm doing. Even, you know, us singing the harmonies, because I have never learned anything. So, and uh, yeah, Emily and Melissa are trained opera singers and Lilo, Broadway singer, and they, they know, you know, from the world how, and the beats and everything, and I have no idea what I'm doing. So It's a so, big merge. <laughs> so my, my songs are like out of pattern too. And that's been used too, because we had to be so intuitive because you can't count the beats and then you have to, we have to just be totally in alignment with each other. So that has been, everything gets used. What, a, uh, what, a collab what an amazing collaboration, that's all I can say, is it's just absolutely amazing that we're, we're able to hear these songs and experience the, the vibration of them and then we're hearing what's behind the, behind the songs. Yeah, yeah. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. <laughs> it's a, yeah. And uh, yeah, and it's not even any like um, patterns of how I receive them. It's like, like Emily shared a bit yesterday. Sometimes I wake up and I'm dreaming a song. And I, I have to like go somewhere so I don't wake anyone up. And, and I record it on my phone. Um, just humming it or the words or just and then the next day Jesus says now you go and pick the guitar of the guitar and then I just start recording it and singing it and and sometimes if I have been going through some um, some intensity instead of going down and you know in the darkness and then I just no Svava you go up pick up the guitar and then I pick up the guitar and then beautiful songs just come through and a lot of them are prayers and some of them are answers from Jesus and some of them are like very much about <clears throat> when I really feel like I am in alignment with truth then there's like I am the holy son of God, or the, the truth comes out in the, in the lyrics. Um, so, yeah. Let's, let's look at a few of those things. Like, <clears throat> she says, when I pick up the guitar, when did you first pick up a guitar? In, uh, in May, uh, well, 2016, so May last year, yeah. May 2018. 18, yeah, yeah. So she's playing the guitar and she picked up a guitar. <clears throat> in May of 2018. <laughs> now, I don't know about you, some of you maybe play guitars. When I pick up a guitar, I can pick up a guitar. I bet a lot of you can pick up a guitar. And last <clears throat> May she picked up a guitar and now she's playing the guitar. <clears throat> I think this is Jesus. Uh, I have to say, uh, this goes against the kind of, I, most people I know who play the guitar don't pick up a guitar and then like, how many months? Six, seven, yeah. 
seven or eight months, and then all of a sudden you're playing the guitar. <clears throat> the other thing is, when I would notice when she was composing, she she bought this uh, program. What was it called? Logic. Logic Pro. She eh? bought this program, Logic Pro, and then I was like, oh. And, and she started, oh, I'm hearing instruments, you know, all the different instruments. And so Logic Pro, this program, brought in the instruments. But then I'm looking at her and she said, oh, I'm going to buy a keyboard. I'm buying a keyboard to hook onto my Logic Pro. That's fine. And then I look over there and guess who's playing the keyboard? Who's playing the keyboard? Who's putting all the notes and the, the tunes, the melodies in and everything? She's over there, her fingers are going, going, going. I said, uh, I've never seen you uh, play the keyboard since I've known you. Oh, I, I played back when I was 11. 11? So she played the keyboard when she was 11, and now 40, what was this, 42? Uh, yeah, I'm 42. So, <laughs> 30, yeah. so now, 30 years later, she just happens to pick it up, and the music you're listening to, a lot of it, that and Zach, who's quite trained, yeah. and so on and so forth. Mm. This is coming from a skill that's been dormant for three decades. And how does a skill that's been dormant for three decades suddenly come alive in such a magnificent way? I think it's Jesus. I think all of us, no matter what our skills and abilities are, no matter how much you say, oh, I don't have these skills, I don't have these skills. You know, I, I look back at the parable of David and I Honestly, I, I was, you talk about being shy, I was so shy through childhood. I was shy through my uh, junior high. I was shy in high school from like uh, 73 to 76. I was shy in university for most of those 10 years. Mm -hmm. I was just shy, 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 shy. Uh, did I like... Did I like to travel? No. David did not like to travel. Shy did not like to travel. What about public speaking? No. Nothing I was inclined to. What about technology? You think I had an inclination towards technology? No. <laughs> I, I stayed away from technology. I remember back in, in the university, they would say, you have to take a computer class. And I was like, oh, I didn't want to take a computer, computer class. So I was resistant to travel, resistant to com technology, resistant to public speaking, and I think part of the shyness was I was quite fearful and resistant around uh, relationships. And so the way things played out was I told you after 10 years of university how Jesus the prompt came in to leave graduate school quite abruptly that was my whole life. Uh, academia and graduate school was my whole self-concept. It was just like being told, leave your strength, leave your, your main devotion behind, just set it behind. And what? I didn't even know what was next. All I was told that I was to leave graduate school, leave the program I was in. And then about um, that was around 1986. Then I was guided to go to a, a humanistic psychology conference out in La Jolla, Pen La Jolla, California. The course came to me. And that's why you have to follow the guidance even if you don't know what's coming next. If you get a prompt to sell your house, you don't have to be given a lecture on, the, on what's going to happen next for you. I, a lot of times you get a prompt to to leave a, a school program, uh, to leave a relationship, to start a relationship, to, to sell a house, to move. There's all these kind of things where the ego wants to know the whole context. Like, like you were doing a little bargaining, like, you know, well, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll talk to David. If I, if I take a walk in the woods and he's there, then that's it. And a lot of us do these bargains with God where we say, basically, yes, I want to hear your instructions and I want to hear your guidance. But you're going to have to give me something. You're going to have to tell me how it's going to work out. Like if I take these steps, how's it going to work out? Well, the Spirit's going to tell you. Joy is how it's going to work out. Happiness is how it's going to work out. Peace of mind is how it's going to work out. But the form of things, you cannot control the form. Jesus says that. 
in the rules for decision, you know, he says that that you can't control the form of of the world. You can't you can't decide upon the form of what you want. When you make a decision for a peaceful, joyful, happy day, when you make a decision to follow Jesus, it's like Jason was saying yesterday, you're not you don't have to always, you won't always feel it. Did I feel it when I got the prompt to go tell my advisor I was going to leave my school psychology program? Did I feel it? Oh, you better believe I did not feel that. I was like, yeah, yeah, well you just can take that guidance and just shove it right back wherever it came from. This was before the course. You know, that, there's a song, take, that, take this job and shove it. <laughs> you can take that prompt and shove it. And then the next day, go tell your advisor you're leaving the program. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I think about that. And then finally, as I started to get sicker and sicker, I started to go, hmm, maybe the prompt is in my own best interest. <laughs> and that I don't know my own best interest. You know how Jesus tells us, in no situation do you know your own best interest. He comes right out at the beginning of the workbook and he tells us that. I was, I didn't feel it. Uh, I have to admit I didn't feel it. I was, I thought it was the greatest threat. But somehow within two or three days I found myself sitting there in my advisor's office and speaking the words and delivering the message that the prompt had given me to give. Did I feel it? Well, all the way up until that moment when it came I think I was in a bit of resistance. That's kind of putting it mildly. And then when I actually did it, I was like, wow, that feels really good. <laughs> that feels amazing. What's next? I don't know what's next, but wow. I said yes, and wow. Feels like a weight has been lifted. Like maybe all along I was I was justifying my academia and I was doing things and I was hanging in with it because I felt it who I was or it, I was pleasing my parents or who knows what all. I probably had all kinds of reasons in there. But I had a moment of surrender. And I think it's important to realize that if you really open up to the Holy Spirit and say, guide me, that, that you really may not, we may have an initial egoic reaction sometimes to the guidance as it's given. So you can't always use what Jason was saying yesterday, the one right use of judgment is how you feel. If you can't tell the difference, Jesus says, between pain and joy, what makes you think your feelings are so pure <laughs> that you can follow your feelings and guide, let them guide you all the way back to the kingdom of heaven? Admittedly, the more you get into the mind training, the more you let go of judgments and self-concepts, the more consistently joyful you feel and the more that inspiration flows, the channel is open, that becomes a real good barometer for, for what you're listening. But you have to be careful because the ego can generate all kinds of rationales, justifications to keep you from following what's in your heart from following your guidance. I know Ernestine, that's your one prayer for the whole, this whole retreat was, may I listen and follow, may I learn to truly listen and follow. And, and that's, can you tell, that's what, it's almost like the whole retreat is coming from Jesus to you perfectly, specifically to your one prayer, like your one prayer has gone out to the whole universe and Jesus is like, oh, Ernestine, how adorable <laughs> that you would would ask for that and now here I'm going <laughs> to I'm going to let fly with it and how is it working maybe we should let Ernestine talk is it is the prayer getting answered very much so david the prayer I'm, I'm feeling that this whole retreat everything you've been saying and swava it's just for it's just an answer to my prayer. It's fantastic. And I'm getting, I'm really getting very touched by it. <laughs> and <laughs> I will be, well, I'm sure this is going to help me to remember every day from day to day to just let go of all my own ideas 
whatever is happening. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> thank you. It, it feels like my heart's bursting. It's fantastic. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you, Ernestine. Thank you for the witness, yeah. Mm. Well, Jeff, why don't we, well, with the time that we have left, I would love, you know, it's just like this has just been everything on my heart that I wanted to share with everyone today. This is so important. This is so important to realize that, that, that hearing that guidance and following it is the most important thing. More important, if, if you're not if you're not hearing it, obviously this is where the Course comes in because the Course is a way to tap into that, that inner voice. And that's why we use the Course. But I'm also really wanting us to all really recognize that, that we have within us, we have within us the capacity, the, every, the channel, the link, the connection that that is the most important thing, and nothing can take that away from you. Even with the Course, you know, I, I carried it around so much, and I used it so much that I wore the, the gold letters off of the book, because I actually had my hands on it so much. I mean, I literally carried it everywhere. And then, at some point when the, the copyright controversy arose around who owns the course and who owns the words and all this and this. I remember getting an email from ACIM correspondent and said it was no name, just ACIM correspondent and and it was saying you must you must not do this, you must not put Course of Miracles on your website in the title or the subtitle and it was all of a sudden it was like uh, the Pope was was coming through my email and telling me what I could and couldn't do with the Course. And I was, at the time, I was like, Jesus, what's happening? And he said, nothing's happening. You have your connection with me. What, what business is it of yours about words and, and lawsuits and ownership of A Course in Miracles? What business do you have? You have me. I'm, I'm the one who's giving you your instructions and you don't need to start to get concerned about a book. Uh, because people were starting to ask me, you know, they would say things, I'm traveling all over and happy and joyful. And then people are coming to me and they're going, you know, there's a lawsuit about A Course in Miracles. There is. And then there's two lawsuits, and then three, and then there's four lawsuits. About the Course? Five, six. At one point there were seven lawsuits going on to determine about who owns the words in A Course in Miracles. And I get people walk, coming up to me in my gatherings going, whose side are you on? And I was like, what? What book are you reading? <laughs> they said, that book. But, but there's a war going on. And I said, no, there's no war going on. The war is over. <laughs> it sounded like John Lennon. The war is over if you want it. Because no one can take away your connection with, with the Holy Spirit and Jesus. There's nothing, there's no person, place, or thing, there's no book, there's no lawsuit, there's no legal, there's nothing that can interrupt your connection with the one inside that's there to awaken you. So that's why Jesus said, be not concerned with the things of this world. You know, be not concerned with what you shall wear or what you shall eat. Take no thought for the morrow. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all else will be added unto you, because it's a direct connection. So in these last six, seven, seven minutes, Jeff, let's open it up. I would love to hear what, what Ernestine shared, what all of you have to share with us, because uh, this afternoon we got a movie session coming, but um, yeah, I would love to hear what you experienced this morning. I had a great time. I enjoyed this. <laughs> Well, I loved every minute of it, so. <laughs> um, okay, so there's some hands up here. Um, I'll just go in order. Go ahead, Stephen. You're going to have to do your unmute thing. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much, David and, and Slava. 
I, I, I um, earlier on, I positioned my um, cursor over on the raise hand button. I thought, man, as soon as there's an open, I'm going to pound that button and get in there. Because <laughs> this is so good, and I couldn't resist because, Baba, you know, and David, I came down there in April, May, sometime, and it was an enlightenment retreat, fantastic experience. And Svaba, you know the story, but I don't know if everyone else does, but I was on the receiving end of a miracle. And it was just sitting there in the session and and um, just everybody was just speaking the truth in their hearts. And I'm just thinking, ditto, ditto, ditto. Yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's well said. And I remember um, sharing that. And then I remember sharing with Svaba that I, I went, I want a song. I want a song called Ditto. And I was just not being flippant, but I was kind of being like, no, that'd be great because it was just coming through my heart. And, and by God, <laughs> sure enough, <laughs> Jesus, and I can say that now because I know Jesus has been there all along, all along. And in your, your sense and your story is so compellingly, um, it's, the, it's a beautiful parable and it's just for all of us. It's, it's the same thing and so I remember you coming back and you had a song you wrote a song called ditto it was ditto and it was it blew me away and it just was shifted my attention like this doesn't happen like this but it's like no this happens like this this is the real world this is how this happens and I thought I, I thought I have another I have a, another request and that is um you know you have the the hashtag me too movement which is all about the sexual assault me and I'm thinking, I would like to hashtag me too, Jesus. And so it's like, no, give me that, give me that hit on the forgiveness and the parable and, and the journey here. So that was just a fantastic morning. And, and what a tremendous shift for me, pulling my mind into all of the parable of Steve relating to the parable of Fava. Yours was just like a zip file. Your parable is a zip file. Um, mine seems to be going kind of on a linear trajectory here, but this this just really pulls a lot together and boosts boost my mind into that vertical um, pool. So thank you so much. And thank you, David, for slowing that down. This is a lesson for me, as I know I have to I have to slow down. And I love the part where we're gonna have you read this course in a third language. Boy, man, when I pull my attention and I slow it down, it just becomes the portal right there, like a laser. So I appreciate that, and I realize that when I slow it down and I get out of that busy mind and I just pull into the tractor beam uh, of, of the Holy Spirit, it really takes on, it, it really opens that portal. And so thank you, David and Suava and everyone joined here to helping slow it down and come in in a beautiful, gentle, loving place. So ditto Svava and everyone and, and hashtag me too Jesus <laughs> oh, love you Stephen we need you Thank on social you. media <laughs> ditto and hashtag <laughs> me too Jesus <laughs> that's oh. fantastic <laughs> oh. Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you and next up is Marguerite go ahead Marguerite um, hi do I have to unmute myself or? No, you're good. Okay. Um, my question is, or something I'd like to share is that uh, Svava's uh, story uh, is um, something I recognize myself in a lot. Uh, I'm just still at the part of being depressed. <laughs> I'm not at the part of um, that full yes. And um, I keep hearing this thought and I know it has nothing to do with the body but you have to leave your family and I know it has nothing to do that I have to do something it's just that I am really struggling with this because I know it's that special love relationship and um, that uh, that is just, it's just so confusing I'm I was wondering if there was something that could be said about when you have a thought that is actually on the level of form. Um, I would almost say like, how can you interpret that? Or I try to listen to Jesus and I try to ask, what do I do? What do I do? Or what do I don't do? It's just that I keep 
being stuck on that level like I have to leave my family and for a long time that made my depression really going into deepness and now it's getting less and less and less but the question is uh, can you share something about um, what is asked of me I don't know what is asked of me yeah well What's coming to me is that um, you're, you're a, a bit at a crossroads, like that song I was singing, you know, uh, being at the crossroads. I bet, spent a lot of time at the crossroads, getting that lonely feeling inside. And to me, when you reach that point of like a crossroads, then the prayer of your heart is really, Spirit, reach me. You need to, to show me. I need a sign. I need a signal. I need something that's obvious. I need something that will come to me in this dream world and I'll go, oh, that, that's an obvious answer. And it's so beautiful that you're answer, asking this question right as we are concluding this session because our next uh, session is we're going to pray into a movie that is an obvious answer. Because admittedly, everyone who's here can relate to, to your question, where they felt this special love in, in relation to a person, uh, maybe a, an occupation, maybe in terms of children, maybe in terms of a family, something, maybe even a country or a culture that there's a strong identification with. And, and they are reaching that point of the crossroads where the, your prayer is right there. You said it so clearly. Like, I don't know how. Like, I, I don't know how. I, I'm willing, but I don't know how. And so I think what, what Svava's was sharing before was that for her, she also reached that place, and you could identify that when you heard what she was sharing, where there were some, some big steps and, and what the world would call big, big jumps. And... Um, both Svava and also uh, when Frances Zhu talks about this too, she, she talks about these things where the world around her were saying, that's huge, oh my God, that's, how can you even say that? How can you even consider that? And yet she had reached a place of prayer and devotion where it was just the next most obvious thing, uh, almost like uh, taking the, putting your foot forward in the, in the next step. Uh, in an automatic way. And that's, and so I thank you for that. It's something I don't think in words with, since we've reached the, the hour, the two, two hour point and a little bit beyond. But I do feel like I, I will put that in prayer with everyone here that we can call forth a movie mm -hmm. uh, that will provide that, that experience for you that will show somehow through the signs and symbols in that movie or through the character in that movie will, sh will be an obvious answer for you. Uh, and we'll hold that in prayer because we feel it. I feel exactly what you're, you're calling on right now. It's a very deep prayer in your heart. And, and we'll pray that that be shown to all of us and, and, and to you. So thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yes. Thank you. Okay, well, we, as I just said, we don't know what's next, but we will take it into prayer and uh, we'll be back in a couple hours with uh, the answer to that prayer. <laughs> Jesus is uh, obviously going to show us, a, give us a movie this afternoon and we'll, it's kind of exciting to find out what that will be. Uh, and we're just really grateful. So thank you all for, for being with us and, and hanging in there with us with all of this. And we love you so dearly. And we just want to send our love and our hearts and our kisses and our hugs and embrace you <laughs> wherever you seem to be in the world and, and know that you are loved and that we are in this together mm -hmm. and we are being shown this undoing together. We're walking hand in hand with many, many mighty companions. We're doing this together. So see you real see soon. You.